the first chapter. Could we please stand for the reading of the gospel? Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, friends. Good morning, grace, mercy, and peace to all of you from God who is our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ of God. Amen. This morning I want to think with you about a very difficult topic, one about which I'd rather not even preach. As a matter of fact, I think I'd rather preach on gun control at an NRA meeting, all right? I mean, this is a tough one. I want to speak on the demonic that's something that has occurred to me, the questions that have happened. Uh, people have been asking things about demons and all of this kind of thing. What do we make of such things? Now, um, I, admittedly, the reason I don't like to talk about it, I can remember when I was in school, I had a professor, we did a, a short segment on something called demonology. Yes, there is such a discipline. Uh, the study of the demonic. And he said to us, I never like to teach this section because it seems to be there's kind of a shadow that falls on the classroom. People have a tendency to be a bit more down. There's just something negative in the air. So come, Lord Jesus, because uh, we want to, to know that Christ is with us, you know, in all this kind of darkness. So it can be kind of a difficult topic. Now, I think there are two things to keep in mind. When we talk about such an issue, C.S. Lewis sagely said there are two equal and opposite errors which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and fill an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. The first error is to disbelieve. We live in a culture that increasingly denies anything supernatural. Everything has a natural explanation. Everything ultimately can be explained by science or math and chemistry. Everything is natural. There is no such thing as a supernatural event. But we know, as the Bard said, there are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in your philosophy that we live also in a supernatural world. There is a reality of that which transcends nature. The second error is to have such an interest in these kinds of things that we begin to become unhealthy about it. Um, all this, you know, uh, new age kind of things, tarot cards, Ouija boards, seances, such things are forbidden for Christians. We should have no part of that. I remember in, I was in New Orleans in October for our son's wedding, and um, I got up Sunday morning and wanted to go to church, and the closest church was the oldest Roman Catholic church in the United States. So I walked down for Mass, and I attended Holy Mass. I, I sat in kind of the corner. I don't know if they knew I was a Lutheran or not, all right? But I, I sat there, and after Mass, I walked out the back door, and there in the courtyard was a, 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 a big display, all these little tables selling New Age paraphernalia, and you get your palm read or your cards read for you. So it was quite a con contrast from holy mass to this kind of bizarre new age dark if you will environment outside in the courtyard what we always need to keep in mind however is that Jesus Christ is lord over all those things that we rightly have a, a little bit of a stay away attitude from Jesus Christ is lord in our gospel lesson when Jesus casts out the demon, all the people are amazed. They said, what a new teaching with authority for even the unclean spirits obey him. Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Now, uh, I have on my desk something that my, my wife gave me. It's a little picture, and I had Kathy find it. It's up here on the screen. This is a painting from a Polish painter who tried to paint a description of a vision of Jesus that a woman, a nun called Sister Faustina, now Saint Faustina, had of Jesus Christ. And so he would paint it, and he tried several times. She kept saying, no, that's not it. But it just had to do because she said, I saw Jesus with all this beautiful light, this warm light coming from him, and he taught her a prayer to teach others, and the simple prayer is, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. When we pray that from our heart, the demons tremble. Now, there are signs of real demonic activity. Now, I wish it was so easy as to identify the demonic. If someone's head begins to spin around and they start spitting green gunk at you and the bed's coming off the floor, you know these Hollywood horror stories, we begin to think, well, there's the demonic, and we unfortunately, therefore, consign the demonic to these extremely rare, bizarre occurrences that do indeed perhaps take place. They are well documented. Uh, Dr. Scott Peck, of uh, the late Dr. Peck, uh, who uh, Case Western Reserve, trained psychiatrist and atheist, came to faith, was baptized, and he came to believe through his practice when he confronted people, there were some people that could not be diagnosed. And he began to confront the reality that some people are led into what he described as evil. This ultimately led him in, into some confrontations in which there were real exorcisms kind of a thing. It's documented in a wonderful little book called People of the Lie by Scott Peck. And you can look that at your leisure. But those cases of demonic possession are very rare and also, if you are a baptized, confessing Christian, you don't got to worry about it because, Jesus, I trust in you. If you are a baptized, confessing Christian, you do not need to worry about demon possession because the Holy Spirit is in you. However, there is the reality of temptation. Now, that's true for everyone that the devil tempts us in many different ways. Well, how do we discern the presence of that which is truly, truly demonic? I would offer three brief ways. First, the demonic always hates the word of God. The demonic always hates the word of God. When Jesus Christ enters the synagogue, he begins to teach the word of God and this demonic presence kind of goes off the rails, goes berserk, if you will, because the word of God is hated by all that is evil. The word of God incarnate in Jesus Christ, the word of God written, the word of God preached and taught, and the word of God sacramentally encountered in baptism and holy communion. And that's why, you know, the devil will hate like the host, this consecrated host, the devil cannot stand the word of God. Martin Luther said the devil hates to hear God's name and cannot long remain when it is uttered and invoked from the heart. And again, pastors would occupy themselves with God's word that they teach the devil to death. So we encounter the word of God and that is kind of the protection, if you will. God's word is around us, among us. It's the sacramental word. It's the presence of the word of God and God's spirit. All of this we have, we have nothing to fear because sometimes I worry. There's another way for Christians to take this in an unhealthy way, and that's when we produce fear. I had a friend in seminary who's now a Lutheran pastor. He was raised in a fundamental Pentecostal church. When he was a little kid, they went to hear some speaker to talk about this subject. The pastor, the preacher, gave a hellfire and brimstone, fearful sermon on the reality of the demonic. And somehow he got it into his little head that the demonic entered through the mouth. And he went home and he hid 
and he put his hands over his mouth, terrified. That is abuse. The demonic is not to be used as a weapon to make people afraid because, Jesus, I trust in you. It is a lack of trust where there is fear. The reality of the demonic is when we, is we confront it, but we also resist it through the power of trusting in the word of God, God's word. It's, and, and by the way, when we sing God's word, um, you know, the sacramental word, I told a joke earlier, and I don't know, it, it's an old joke, but some people laugh, so I'll try it. You know how you make holy water? You boil the hell out of it. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you laughed, but, but because, you know, oh, even a good word, the kids are like, see, the devil has no sense of humor. The devil can't laugh. Everything's so serious, and everybody's got to be afraid. The devil's behind every door. Baloney. Baloney. It's real, but when you fear it, the devil wins. We're not to be controlled by our fear, but by God's word. Jesus, I trust in you. Second, because the devil hates the word of God, he hates God, or I never know what pronoun to you, he, it, or she. I don't know what it is, you know, but for the sake, the devil hates God's people. I guarantee when demonic activity is about, I wish um, the devil would just kind of come in and be evident, you know, get people's heads spinning and so forth. The devil is much more clever and sinister than that. He comes in amongst God's people to disrupt the peace of God's people. They're in synagogue and for the Sabbath rest and the, this demoniac comes in shouting and carrying on and everyone's disrupted. The peace of God is disrupted because the devil always seeks to bring chaos to the people of God. Confusion and chaos and conflict are the weapons he uses. In our second lesson from Corinthians, we have a perfect example. This is a big controversy in the early church, whether a Christian should, now, now listen to this carefully, whether a Christian should eat food that had been sacrificed to idols. Now some of the Christians thought, we can't do that, because you're eating kind of, and regarding a demon somehow. But others thought, hey, Jesus is my Lord, I can eat what I want. Food is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And so they come to the pastor. They say, Pastor, what are you going to do? These people are eating the things to demons. And other people say, oh, they're not eating things to demons. And the pastor's put in the middle. You know what Paul did? Paul so wisely says, look, food will not bring us close to God. We're no worse off if we don't eat and no better off if we do. But, now listen, for the sake of the body, for the sake of the concord among God's people, Paul advises caution. If food causes one of my brothers or sisters to stumble, I'm not going to eat. Lesson for us, we must love our neighbor more than our own opinion. Sometimes we must say, I'm not going to exercise my freedom as a Christian for the sake of concord in the body of Christ. Now you think about that. The devil hates God's word. The devil hates God's people. And finally, the devil hates God's way. The last two weeks I've been preaching over at uh, the sanctuary service, and we had those texts about Jesus calling disciples and when Jesus says, follow me, he means, that's kind of shorthand for come learn from me, become my student, apprentice yourself to me. You know, we, especially we Lutherans, we're really good at claiming Christ as our Lord and Savior. We got that one down. But guess what else Jesus wants to be? He wants to be our rabbi. He wants to be our teacher. And we become his students when we listen to our, his word and when in our life we consider his word and we're always interacting, trying to understand his word because his word is the way toward wisdom. There's a path that leads 
to God and there's a path that leads away from God. Jesus Christ says, come and follow me. Come and follow me, a path that leads to life. And that's why, again, to quote C.S. Lewis, mere Christianity commits us to believing that the devil, now listen, in the long run, is an ass, is a fool. You want to follow a fool? Many people do. Come, follow me. Jesus Christ hates it when people listen. Or the devil hates it. <laughs> Flip that around. Flip that around. I, could, I put it like this. That Jesus Christ hates it when we listen to the devil. Follow something else. Come, says Jesus. Follow me. Now there's one final word in closing because I think there's a tendency for us to always kind of do this kind of thing. Who's out there? You know, who needs to hear the message? Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago, you know, when he was a Russian dissident and put in prison, he came to faith in a Russian prison, and he wrote these words. Gradually it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties, but right through every human heart. Not someone else's heart. Right here. That's where the battle is waged. Not out there. Right here. May God help us to know the reality of evil when it lifts its ugly, dreary head. A hatred of God's word, a hatred of God's people, and a hatred of God's way. But guess what? Let's say it together. Jesus, I trust in you. One more time. Jesus, I trust in you. And the devil flees. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. will receive our offering at this time.